Welcome again. My name is Christopher Matius. I'm uh, the head of the climate change team in C4, and I'm your moderator for this session. And we have a very distinguished panel here with five people. Uh, Daniel Mudiasso, who is my colleague, uh, scientist at C4, uh, heading our peatland research in the so-called swamp project. Then we have Babudi Vardana, who is uh, deputy head of the peatland agency uh, in Indonesia. We have Lira Miles from, oh, sorry, we have Serena. Uh, yeah, I'm, you're not sitting in, in this order. So we have Serena here uh, from the Global Environment Center, uh, Serena Liu. And then we have Lira Miles from the UN Environment, uh, World Environment, no, World Conservation Monitoring Center, sorry. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's linked to uh, UN Environment, but she's actually in Cambridge. And then we have Professor Mitsuru uh, Osaki from Hokkaido University. And um, the structure of the session will be that each of them will give a short introduction. Then we have a discussion on the podium, and then uh, we open the floor for questions to you, to the audience. Ah, and I forgot we have also a rapporteur, which is my colleague here sitting here in front, Amy Duchel, also from CIFO. So we also, we're also getting meeting notes later. And, um, and you may have wondered why the name Black, black Gold, Peatlands Black Gold for Mitigation. Some of you may remember the time when uh, fossil fuel, oil, was called black gold because it was so important and so valuable that, uh, that it was actually called black gold and you could make a lot of money with it. You can still can, probably, otherwise it wouldn't be mined. Uh, but I found that fitting that um, another rich carbon resource below our feet, which is peatlands, uh, and which is also important to us, but not by mining it, but by keeping it in the ground. Uh, we might also call it black gold for mitigation if we manage to keep it in the ground. So it's a golden opportunity for us to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to store carbon because, as you may have heard in earlier presentations, uh, peatlands cover around 3% of the global land surface, but they, they harbor 30% they harbor in Amazonia, we heard this morning, even 40% of, uh, of the soil carbon stock. So it is a, there's a huge resource of carbon in, the, in, these, in these peatlands, and it's important to get, uh, to get the mitigation, or to get the conservation right and the restoration for mitigation. Um, so you may actually ask, ask yourself, what can I learn now in this session? We had a we had actually some of us had uh, a global peatland initiative side event last week in Bonn in the Substar climate conference. Uh, we also had a C4 European Space Agency and University of Vienna side event in, in the same venue also last week. And we had a three day uh, global peatland initiative workshop this week. So what is new now in this session? Uh, and we have parallel sessions also. I think we have a very distinguished panel here that is also new in this composition uh, in all these events so far in the, in the last two weeks. And so we are going to learn a lot of new things. And so I think it's, it's going to be very exciting. It's important that we have precise data on peatlands and that's part of the, of the presentations is going to, are going to talk about that. And it's, it's important that we also uh, get restoration right and that's uh, what other speakers are going to talk about. B before we get into the presentations by the speakers, I'd like to show one slide myself. Uh, I don't know, are the slides showing? Are they on that screen or? <clears throat> Can you show the slide? Yesterday I made a little, uh, a little, piece of uh, research looking at the, at the uh, NDC registry. You know the NDCs are the nationally determined contributions. The, the way the Paris Agreement is going to be filled with activities from the bottom up. And I looked for search terms, forestry, in 190, 139 uh, 
submitted NDCs. There's a little, it's a little bit lower number than the INDCs, but I just looked at, at the NDCs. 100 times forestry comes up. 89 times land use comes up. 68 times forest comes up, and then it goes down coast 20 times, mangrove 18 times, lake 10 times, wetland 6, and not all of them are tropical. And then if you look at peatlands or any other peat-related terms, there is zero. So I think we need to do a little bit more in order to move peatlands up into the NDCs and to the awareness of, of policy makers and, and put them in, into the policy activity in, in those countries, policy action in those countries. Uh, of course, uh, the peatlands may be implicit in when you talk about forests, when countries talk about land use and so on, but I think it, it may be necessary uh, that uh, there is a li little bit more of, um, of attention given to this particular ecosystem. And so that's what I'd like to keep you, in, for you to keep in mind to, f to frame this session a little bit in terms of where we want to go uh, with peatlands in climate action. And that's um, uh, all I have to say myself right now. Um, I'd like to move into the presentations, and the first speaker will be uh, Daniel Modiasso. As I said before, he's my colleague. He's a researcher. He has a, he has a um, PhD in forestry, uh, in, in meteorology from, uh, from uh, University of Reading. Before he had, a, he had studied in IPB in Bogor, the, the agricultural university. He's, uh, he has also been uh, working in the IPCC a lot, and he has been Deputy Minister of Environment for two years in, uh, in, 2000, in 2001. And, um, and, and uh, in that, uh, in that um, capacity was also national focal point for the IPCC and for the CBD. And so now he's a very cherished colleague in C4 and, uh, and leading what we call the SWAMP, project, which is just a very convenient acronym for the Sustainable Wetlands and uh, Adaptation and Mitigation Program. Uh, so um, Daniel will tell you a little bit about um, a new peatland map. And Daniel, you have to stand on this okay. thing here because that's the only microphone we have. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christopher, for the introduction, and uh, I was standing like, like uh, Christopher last week, exactly on Thursday, chairing uh, a session in Substar on this particular topic. Now I'm presenting it. But I, I want to assure you that uh, what I'm trying to, to describe today, can you have the slides, please? Uh, slightly different in the context of this uh, GLF, why it matters and who matters for whom, and I want to make sure that uh, the, the history of developing this map, uh, it is not, it's not a, a final product. Uh, it, is, it is a living document. If you visit the, the landscape lab, right in the corner, there is an interactive uh, map that everybody can uh, follow through the website. So the title here is, it is new, but also interactive. So I, I will tell you why is it new and how it can be interactive. Right, so it is new because it was published two weeks ago uh, in the Global Change Biology, and we try a new approach in terms of developing this. Uh, first, it is a medium uh, kind of moderate kind of scale. We use MODIS, so that's, that's free for everybody, and it's not very fine, but we cover global wetland. So it's a huge data set that we have and uh, try to uh, extract the best data. And we, we look at it from the 2010 to 2012, and the average is somewhere around 2011. That's, that's the, the anomaly of, of the, the climate. So don't be surprised if you find numbers are overestimated because it's La Nina year. So when we are talking about wetland, the, the globe was very wet at that time. Um, it is new because we, we try to use uh, what we call expert system. Experts mean that uh, we don't impose our, our intention to do things. We use the best available data, and uh, 
you know, it is there and we use it. Uh, first of all, is to look at the water balance of the globe, to look at the input and output so we see what's the remaining or the, the deficit, if you wish. And uh, another layer is the topography so that we know where are these uh, surpluses will be accumulating and use the SRTM to look at that so we can see how wet the surface is. So we have that classification of wet soil in the map. So we have wetland map, and the next challenge is how to uh, put the layer of peatland. So again, uh, the expert says that if you have, this is the definition we adopted, uh, organic material more than 30 centimeters, that's peat. So you like it or not, that's, that's what is the, the rest of the word define it. And uh, if the peat is more than 50% organic material, uh, then uh, that's even finer in terms of information. And that is about 30, 29% of, of, of carbon in it. So from wetland, we have peatland, and that's global. So this is the, the expert system we try to, to adopt it here. The map, you can see it in the uh, website. Uh, it's global, but I want to highlight what's, what's there. We found that wetland and peatland is found more in Latin America instead of Asia. So we found 46% of the global peatland is in, in Latin America, not in Asia. Asia is second. And by country, uh, Brazil is the largest, larger than Indonesia. And then the remaining is in, in Africa. So that's... that's the thing that we, we ourselves are kind of surprised, so it's, it's different. Again, we, because we use different definition, or the definition that we adopted, and we use uh, 2011 as La Nina year. If we zoom it in this area, in uh, the Marañón in, uh, in Peru, uh, I'm glad that Peruvian uh, scientists are here, and then also the work in Peru are represented, and in Congo Basin, and in Indonesia, there are different kind of density in terms of uh, carbon because we also managed to assess the depth and also the, the carbon content in each of this. Uh, again, this is the limitation we have. We only have somewhere around 300, 350 data set, data point across the globe. So this map invites you, if you are expert, to, to work into more detail. The, the area is there. The, the TIFF file is downloadable. Uh, if you look at the, the map that we have here, basically, uh, you, look at, you can interact with this map, and uh, you can find where the wetlands are, where the pit, lands, the pit are, and then you zoom it in a country, and then you can download the data in TIFF uh, format. So you, you can work it out. Uh, that's why it is interactive so that uh, we also want to make sure you register so we have the record who are visiting and contributing so that at the end of the day, we will be able to, to improve the map that we have. So the next step, what we would like to do, as I said earlier, this is a life uh, and, and a living uh, kind of map. We will improve it by having people validating the, the map. As I said, it's only one year, so we need to scale it down in terms of temporal resolution. If people have the chance to look at the phenology, uh, finer resolution in terms of climate, then we might, have a, we might be better off in terms of uh, refining where the wetland and peatland are. And then, it is not there at the moment that we only work in uh, lowland peatland. We have not done the mountain Pit, and uh, that's, that's huge in Peru, in China, in uh, Highland of Africa also. So it, it is still untouched, it is not done. And in the context of this uh, forum, we are talking about restoring pitland or wetland. If we have finer resolution in terms of time, we might be able to monitor uh, time by time the degraded peatland so that we can uh, do uh, the, locus, the scoping of the area and the, the situation and direction or trend of degradation as well. So 
in the global context, as uh, Christopher mentioned, actually the, the awareness about the importance of peatland for climate change mitigation and adaptation is already there about three years, four years ago. We were invited by the uh, substar of the UN C, and they intentionally uh, run a workshop like what we did last week, especially to look at high carbon reservoir, which include peatland, mangrove, and wetland. And it is there in, in the agenda, which was not in the agenda item of the UNFCCC. So hopefully, from now on, uh, wetland, peatland will be an agenda item. If you know the, the process in the Substa in the uh, COP, uh, APA is, I think it's got 13 agenda item now. I hope Pitland will have more and more in terms of attention from the negotiator because uh, it is very timely now to, to look at, again, uh, technology, uh, methodologically speaking, uh, IPCC was asked by the UNFCCC to, to develop the methodology to do the accounting or inventory of of, of greenhouse gases of carbon in wetland. So this is a special report, a supplement to the 2006 guideline, and uh, the, main, the most important thing from that document is the message uh, or the methodology for wetland, including peatland and, and mangrove. And lastly, uh, as uh, Christopher mentioned in the beginning, uh, if we relate this kind of work and try to capture what is the, the need of the national uh, government. Uh, NDC is one, because uh, we, we see a lot of countries in that survey, you can see people already use NDC as an entry point. And again, it is a, a living document, they will revise it uh, year by year. So Pitland can be part of this. I believe Indonesian government is picking this up and uh, Peruvian will be soon, and Congo, when we discussed with the delegates in, in, in Bonn last week, they are very eager to include uh, Pitland in their NDC. And then another uh, mitigation option uh, through REDD is also openly uh, available, and it's, it's time now to, to explore that. And the beautiful thing with, with NDC uh, the, with the Paris Agreement is that they also include or even look at adaptation in a balanced manner. So uh, again, peatland, wetland will be part not only for mitigation but also adaptation. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, please keep your questions for later. Um, I'd like to ask now uh, Babudi Vardana from the Peatland Agency uh, to speak. He's the deputy head of the National Peatland Restoration Agency. You know the Peatland Agency. For, he's a head for planning and cooperation. He previously worked at WWF Indonesia as director for policies, sustainability, and transformation. And he also worked for a long time, more than 10 years, at the Ministry of Environment, uh, where he was, at the end, head of division of, for biosafety. And he will, uh, uh, so his, his work is on policy analysis and sustainable transformation, and he will talk to us about using LIDAR for peatland restoration planning. Uh, would you please come to the microphone? Thank you, Christoph. The slide, please. So, as in the morning, Panasir said that the two technology that PRC requires, the two most, one of them is on the technology for pitland mapping. So I will present one of the state of arts in pitland mapping that we use. It's not the newest one, but uh, this is the best available uh, technology that we have currently. So we use LIDAR technology for peatland restoration uh, planning. Oops. So I will present you the background of uh, why 
the government of Indonesia really focusing on and put efforts to restore peatland. One of the reasons is the continuous in 18 years without any caps. Every year in 18 years we have forest and land fire in Indonesia and more and more those fires happen on of a peatland. And what is the significant effect of a peatland fire is that it can get fire in the long uh, time period because of the amount of biomass that get burned uh, throughout the uh, fire season or the dry seasons. Uh, I also would like to give you an introduction on LiDAR and aerial photography technology for our peatland uh, restoration planning. The use of thematic spatial analysis for land cover and hydrotopography data the availability of geospatial thematic data for biophysical restoration planning, and uh, the, the closing, the uh, kesimpulan, what is the, the summary of uh, the use of this technology for restoration planning. So remote sensing technology, if any of you have been in pitland before, so you understand the advantage of having this remote sensing technology because we can gather the various information type, time, money, manpower, efficiency, accessibility. You know how accessible it is the uh, peatland forest? It's difficult to go there and uh, to, to go to the point that we need to, uh, to check in the peatland. Track changes over time because we use the satellite imagery and then on the same spot of area, we can have uh, data from time to time. So we can monitor the changes of land cover. And with LiDAR and radar, we can have three-dimensional data that we can use to make uh, models on and also to, to put where the uh, constructions of rewetting should be built. The type of sensor that we use, we have active and passive one. We have type of uh, platform. We, we can use space-borne uh, platform, satellite, or we have airborne, small, medium-sized airplane, airplane, uh, drone, and also hand carried, or we carry it through the land and through the pit land. For instance, the ground penetrating radar that used by C4 also to measure the depth of pit land. So the LiDAR technology stands for the light detection and ranging is the same as radar but using uh, laser beam. And uh, we use three type of uh, measurement that we have. We use inertial measurement unit to ensure that the, the data that gathered throughout the flying of this airplane to gather data is uh, accurate enough. And from large scale mapping for detailed plan, uh, we have recording data acquisitions, we have points cloud laser data, we have assessment and then resulted in digital elevation model and uh, 3D point cloud modeling. What is used for? So we can look into a highly resolution data that we can see the ground sample distance of 10 centimeters vertical accuracy of 10 centimeters also, and the horizontal accuracy of seven centimeters. So it's quite accurate and it's quite detailed. And the spatial data produced is aerial photographic, the DEM, digital elevation model, and also thematic and base map at the scale of one to 2,500 scale. And land cover in 3D point cloud, we can see that we have the overview of the areas in, in terms of forest covers and also the what called the height and also the structures of vegetation over the same area. And then uh, we apply it to the uh, land use of the peatland. We can see that uh, the difference between the young oil palm, mature oil palm, swampy shrub, expand over areas over the peatland and also forest land with good uh, tree cover. 
all of those three distinct uh, features is the main input that we use for peatland restoration planning. The 3D modeling of the same map, and then the peatland hydrological unit map that the government already published based on the scale of 1 to 2,500,000 2, scale, and also peatland uh, designation map. Designation map means the designations for the cultivation and for the protections map. It should be developed uh, for the scale of 1 to 50,000. That's uh, one zero more. That's, we need, we need to, to correct that. Okay. And then we have hydrological analysis map that we produce in the scale of 1 to 2,500 which we can gather the information of the drainage density, flow pattern, flow directions, and also the, the width and the depth of each of the canal. And also to generate a land cover map with the vegetation density, cultivated land, natural land, and also the types of vegetations over the land. It's all produced in one flight of the map. The, the, the two I could not point it in here. But the, the two map on below is the produce of the LIDAR, one of the produce of the LIDAR. And using the dam from the data, uh, from the LIDAR, we can uh, point out in which directions of the canals that we should block. In these examples, with the length of these uh, particular canals, we have uh, 5.7 kilometers length of this particular canal from the yellow X to the other yellow X. And from the 2X, the height difference is only 50 centimeters, in which that's the uh, criteria for putting the uh, canal blocking or the dams. So the head dams will be on that X, the first X, and then the second X. This is also the result of using LIDAR. And also, using the LIDAR, we, we can see the uh, hydrotopography. We can also identify which one is the primary drainage canal, which one is the secondary drainage canal and the shape of the dome, and also the natural drainage system or reference system. And also, we use these, those maps, the seven maps. We do the database pit restoration land unit. We overlay with the data of forest product timber utilizations, meaning the concessions of uh, forestry industry and also the concessions of palm oil industries. And with the two overlay of uh, those uh, databases, we can identify which one and who's going to be responsible for the restorations of particular land. UPRG means Unit Pengelola Restorasi Gambut the management unit that responsible for the peatland restorations. We can identify any each of the uh, unit management. And we do the spatial joint, so we produce matrix. Matrix, we call it matrix for the uh, restoration action. And it has been produced for the uh, several assessment, spatial-based assessment. We have the general description of biophysical and socioeconomic condition for each of the provinces. And then we have descriptions of each pitline hydrological unit. And then the narrative matrix, and then we produce restoration locations map. What it look like? So this is the uh, aerial photography, and then we can identify uh, what is the type of land use of the pitline. This is also the examples of abandoned peatland. Uh, this is the burn of uh, areas. And then why we need the high resolution data for peatland management planning. We need to rezone or reallocating peatlands land use uh, for the production and protection purpose. We have peatlands water management design that sometimes we need to redesign the water management of the uh, management unit providing three-dimensional features, detailed thematic data for the vegetational covers, land use, 
land management system, hydrotopography, uh, morphometric of the peatland, and topographic of the peatland. And then we identify the restorations of degraded peatland uh, through revetting, revegetations, and other socioeconomic uh, revitalizations of the local communities. This is the surface elevations of Chawang Air Lalang Pit Hydrological Unit. Uh, you can see in that that uh, the water management is important in the uh, plantations on pitland areas to prevent fire and also subsidence of the pitland because the continuous subsidence can lead to another disaster. It is not fire, but it will be flooding. It's the same economic effect that will hit the uh, local community. We can use also the result of the LIDAR mapping to uh, measure the carbon stock estimations, especially the above ground uh, carbon biomass, and also using the multi-stage processing of small to medium scale, scale with the generalization of aggregations and then detailing, we can move both from the uh, land cover and land use uh, map. We can also use the uh, landscape ecology, ecological approach to use the, uh, to gather the information on land cover according to specific criteria and each of criteria have the implications on the management or the restoration actions. And this is the matrix that uh, we produce from overlaying and doing the analysis. We can see in that matrix the kabupaten or the districts that the restoration activity should be implemented, the unit that is responsible to do the restorations, and also the locations in terms of villages. So we have also the programs we call uh, Desa Peduli Gambut or, or Village Friendly Pit friendly villages program. And also we can identify how many canal blocking that we need to uh, develop to construct in each of this unit management. Down to or going right to the uh, numbers of uh, revegetations, the area that we need uh, to do the uh, revegetations of a degraded peatland. And this is uh, the result. We can blow this uh, map up to the scale that we can identify how many canal blocking that we need to put and uh, what type of uh, revegetation activities that we need to, uh, to establish. So the red one means that those area has been burned in 2015. The blue one represents the dome or deep, canal, deep, deep pit that already been uh, canalized, and the green one is the area of pit dome or pit uh, tap pit that's still intact. So you can see from this hydrological unit of Chawang and Lalang, the intact pit line is uh, less than 20% uh, of the whole hydrological unit. So thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting and very detailed presentation, Prabhuji. Uh, I'm calling uh, now Lira Miles uh, for the next presentation. Uh, Lira is a senior program officer in, uh, for climate change and biodiversity in the UN environment. And as I said before, it's actually the UN Environment World Conservation Monitoring Center she's working in. She has been working in her life uh, before on Red Plus, and she's still supporting countries on special planning for Red Plus. Uh, while also considering biodiversity and, and ecosystem services. And, uh, and uh, 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 she also, before joining the, the, the WCMC in 2002, she did her PhD in Leeds University on biodiversity in Amazonia. Okay, Lira, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Could we have the slide, please? So despite having done my PhD in Amazonia, today I'm talking about the Congo Basin. It's a real 
Oh, could we have the slide? It's a real honor to be here today with such a prestigious panel. So thank you very much for having me. I've come here from the Global Peatlands Initiative meeting. So there's been a second partners meeting of the Global Peatlands Initiative in Jakarta over the, the last few days. And I've also been privileged to be able to visit some of the peatland area in Sumatra. So it's, it's really great to hear these these additional explanations from BRG on how Indonesia is planning to restore its peatlands. But um, what I wanted to talk about today is a completely different part of the world, the Congo Basin. Could we have the next slide, please? Or can I do that? I have the power. So one of the first things the Global Peatlands Initiative is planning to do is a rapid response assessment on the world's peatlands. So it'll have the opportunity to build on some of the work from Daniel and his colleagues. Uh, the intention of the initiative is to build awareness, particularly amongst decision makers in peatland countries and indeed in the donor community, to help bring the plight of peatlands to the world's attention. And the rapid assessment will help to explain some of what we know and some of what we don't know about peatlands. Um, fill some of those, well, start to identify some of those data gaps. And until recently, in this area in the Congo Basin, there's been a very big data gap. But there's been a piece of work undertaken by Greta Dargi, Simon Lewis, and many colleagues, both from the UK and from the Congo Basin. Um, the university, I'm going to pronounced this wrongly, but the University of Marion Ungabi, as well as the Wildlife Conservation Society in the Congo, have helped with this work. Um, what they've been doing is looking at this area, this green blob on the map you can see, is a, a shallow depression about the size of Germany in the central Congo basin called the Cuvette Centrale. And in this area, it was clear that there was peat, but there wasn't a great deal of evidence to suggest how much peat there might be. So this team went to the area, they did some transects, so they got an idea of what kinds of vegetation types were on peat, and also what the depth of the peat was and the density of the peat in those transects. Um, it's quite a small team, but they looked at eight transects of between, I think, two and 20 kilometers. So it's a, it's a good first sample. And then they've taken some remote sensing information. So like Daniel, they've been looking at the topography. They use radar to get to an idea of standing water, and they use optical imagery. And from this, they built a model of the vegetation types. So they had an idea of which vegetation types were on peat, and they modeled the vegetation types to get to an estimate of, of the peatland area in the region. And they got to around 145,000 kilometers squared. So this is a, a much larger area than people had previously been aware was likely to be covered by peatland. And uh, the, that team would be the first to say, this is a first estimate, but it's pretty exciting. Uh, there's a, that estimate suggests that the, the median depth of these peatlands is about two meters, and across that area, that means there could be as much as 30 gigatons of carbon, which is about the same as the amount of biomass in the forest above and below ground across the two countries, so the Republic of Congo on one side and the Democratic Republic of Congo on the other. So it's the same story all over the world, right? The, the peatlands occupy just a small fraction of the national area, but they have a, a very large proportion of the carbon. But of course, we already knew that this area was important for other reasons, and um, the center that I come from, a particular interest is biodiversity. Uh, we're uh, a biodiversity conservation and ecosystem services center. So we then worked with Greta and Simon and colleagues to take the opportunity to do a, a very rapid as first assessment of what else was going on in this region. And I'll just show you a couple of maps from that. And that, that's a contribution to the rapid response assessment that I mentioned to start with. So 
Clearly, this area is important for, for wildlife, for biodiversity. What we can see here in green is the areas that are, are likely to be peat swamp forest, you know, emphasizing again that this is a first map. So these are all the areas that the maximum likelihood model that they used suggested was more than 50% likely to be peat swamp forest. And the darker green areas are those that are richer in threatened vertebrates, which is species like the western gorilla over to the west or the bonobo over to the east. And then the pink areas, you can see the little pink polygons, those are key biodiversity areas. So the areas that have been identified using a, a, standard, as a standard that says they're of global importance for biodiversity. And many of these areas have already been designated as protected areas of one kind or another by the two governments. So you know, there's clearly an existing commitment to conservation in this region, which is encouraging. And to date, the peatland in this area is in, in a great condition. These forests are relatively intact. The peat swamp forest itself is about a, a day's walk from the river. So that's part of the reason why there wasn't very much information about it, is it's been relatively remote and inaccessible. But that picture may be starting to change. And as this map shows in, in red, you can see areas of tree cover loss. That's come out of the global Matt Hansen data set. And in this particular example, um, you can see the big polygons are showing where there are concessions that are granted or being offered for exploration for oil and gas, or the little yellow ones for, for mining concessions. So you can see that the, there's a possibility that this area will not remain in, in such an undisturbed state for so long. There are also quite a few logging roads that are starting to come into the region, and there are, uh, around the edges again, there are some logging concessions that have been designated. So if we, we could be at a turning point for this area. And as the, the delegates from the Congo that have been at the meeting to, today and at the Global Peatlands Initiative Partners meeting have been very keen to stress, they'd like to make sure that these peatlands are protected in the future and they don't experience some of the problems that have been seen in Southeast Asia with drainage and burning. So, um, what can researchers do to, to support this, this grand, grand objective of keeping those peak carbon stocks intact? One obvious step is to refine the carbon stock estimates. So, the only transects that have been produced so far have been, been done by this team, and they've just been done in a, a limited part of this huge basin. So, there's an opportunity to use the vegetation map to quite selectively sample other areas and then to improve the map based on those samples to get a better idea of you know, how accurate the map is. But I don't think we need to wait for a perfect map to be able to, to start thinking about what the future threats might be to this region and what the policy responses should be. So we can produce some scenarios that look at, at that kind of uh, the concessions data that I was showing later, but also what the likely changes are in commodity demand, food, food demand, and so on in the region, to see, have a, a better idea of the risk of agricultural conversion, because you know, people really aren't very clear about this so far. And then also it would be very helpful to know, in this region, if there was drainage, what would the effects of that drainage on ecosystem services be? You know, we have a lot of lessons from Asia Pacific, but it is a different part of the world and, and there is very little knowledge on what drainage might do to the fire risk in this region, what role the peatlands play in the regional hydrology and how that might be affected, what it might do to water quality and so on. And then of course the people are working at every level, you know, from the local communities up to the governments, need to think about how they're going to manage this area in future. So you know, there's room for some action research on what the communities are thinking, how they're using the peatlands so far, what their aspirations are for their own future development. 
and then to, to get to supporting the, the national government, the local governments, and thinking about what sound policy options are so that there's, this area can be protected and that any use is sustainable. So I think there's a, a strong role for the international community to play in supporting the Congos, who are the, the two governments are really just beginning to have an idea of the the massive carbon stocks that they are responsible for here. They already knew that they had 30 gigatons in their forest, but now another 30 gigatons of carbon is a pretty big deal. Thank you. Oops, sorry. Thanks, Lira, uh, for this very interesting glimpse into what's happening in the Congo Basin. Um, our next speaker is Professor Mitsuro Ozaki from Hokkaido University. As I said before, he's a professor emeritus of the research faculty, and he is a professor of, grad of the Graduate School of a Agriculture, or he was. Um, he's, he's a well-known, globally leading scientist on, on peatlands and wetlands. Uh, he works also on greenhouse gas emissions, on fires, on rehabilitation and conservation of peatlands. He was, uh, for several years, the project leader of a GST JICA project on wildfire and carbon management in peat forests in Indonesia. And this work resulted also in the first book of Tropical Peatlands, uh, which was published last year. He's also president of the Japan uh, Peatland Society, and uh, he has several collaborations with, uh, with other universities and, and with uh, organizations in Indonesia. So he will be talking to us about peatland restoration uh, to enhance carbon neutral, neutral function. Professor Ozaki, please come to the microphone. <clears throat> so the <laughs> title is a little bit uh, different. And so you can see the, this is a quite new terminology, A, B, C, D, E, F, S, securities, uh, enhancement by the tropical peatland restorations. So you see the security is uh, something opposite concept of the crisis. This is uh, the security and uh, the crisis is something uh, the front or back and so I want to talk the, the peatland the, from the another aspect. So if we uh, dissolve or destroy the completely peatland, which enhance the, the securities. So the, this ABCDEF is several securities. Could you give the next one? Yes, what is the uh, ABCDEF securities? So, as you know, the, the natural capital in Pitran, which is very high because of the high carbon reserve ecosystems, and uh, you know the already, so also the high water the reserve ecosystem. And so, the data I'm talking about uh, biomass productivity is also very high compared to the mineral soil in tropical. And so, uh, uh, the biodiversity, also very high. So if the natural, the peatland, the maintain or rehabilitated, the, we, we can get this kind of the high value of the natural capitals. And so the, this is the ABCDFS securities. And if the, uh, we overcome the, the crisis, because of crisis uh, mainly the depend on the developing of the canals, and the water level is decreasing. So this is one of the, the crisis, and so which is very affected by the climate change. And so, but if to rehabilitate, to recover the, this kind of the, the drain, the, the ecosystems, so we can get a very high value of the ABCDFS securities. What is A is a aquatic, this is a water, the, you know, the, this is a very high the, the water the reserve ecosystem, so water security is increasing, and the biodiversity is very high, and climate change, 
the security also the increasing because the, this is the, the contribute to mitigation as a carbon emission reduction and adaptation uh, as a high the biomass the production the, even in the, the high the water level the conditions which is against to the El Nino effect. And also the disaster securities. So what is a disaster and impeach? That is the main is a fire and the haze. And so energy securities, so the, if the good management, so we can get a huge amount of the biomass from the peatland. And so food feed security. So for example, the, the, if the, we're growing the sago, so this is a very adapted the peatland and so give the huge amount of the, the starches. And so this is a, will be the contributed to, to, to food security or feed securities. So if roughly calculate, so the, if compared to the, the, the starch production of the rice, so the, this value is almost 20 times or 10 times higher than the rice. And so the social securities, okay, so if the, we success this ABCDF, so this security is contributed to the social or national the, the securities. So next one, please. And so the, for thinking the, the security of a crisis, this is uh, reported from the World Economic the Forums. And so this the forum the point out what is a global the, the crisis the, in, in this 21st centuries? So the, you see the, this, the bottom is a livelihood to go to the, the right. So this the, the livelihood the crisis is increasing. And so this uh, bad cards, the um, impact to the, cli and the climate and so the natures and so on. And so this security, uh, the crisis also increasing. And so what is uh, the most highest, the, the crisis the, from this use two criteria. So the circle, red circle showing that is a water crisis, in especially the terrestrial, the, and the waters, the amount of the waters and the quality of the waters. So now you know the 21st century, so we must thinking the, or caring about not only the carbon, also water is very important. As already I said, the, the peatland is a both the element, very high the stock. So the, we, we should to estimate, de-estimate the carbon function or water function in the peatland. So next one. So why the, the, this kind of the, the crisis? Why is, uh, for example, the Victoria Falls in the Zambezi rivers? So this is a very famous, the falls. So 2012, so we visit IPCC committees, <laughs> visited here and take pictures. And the border of the Zam, uh, Zam, mm, to, <laughs> Zimbabwe and uh, the Zambias. And so the, the 2015, maybe you know the Super El Ninos. And so you see the no waters. I'm very surprised. It's the big, the, fall, the falls, almost two kilometers or so, but dry up. And so I asked to the, the, the person of the, who managed the, the park, Years and so never happened the before. Even in the 1990s, the seven to eight, also we had the uh, super niños, but waterfall still remained the, and in us of the waters, which mean maybe so climate condition almost same the, in the both years. And so we are, I'm the very worrying about the water stock now, so the getting decrease in, in this ecosystem in Africa. And next one, this is the uh, Kinabal Mountain, the, in the Borneo, highest mountain in the Kinabal. And you can see the, the crowded, the surrounding the, the mountains. So this, the cloud gives something moisture 
to ecosystem. Then, so you see, next one. Next one. So the, we, we can find the peat the, in this the cloud forestry from the, the 1,200 one to 100, 500 the height in, in, in these areas. So all days almost cloud, then so very humid. And we can find the spongrass and we can find the, the peat in the slope. The, here is around 30, 30 centimeter to 50 centimeters, sometimes one meter. So huge, the, the pit is located in this uh, cloud forestry in, in, in Borneo. And so, but uh, I, I visited to, to 2015 in Super El Nino years. This, they're normally very wet, the huge the waters contain, but the dry up completely. And so you can see the bottom, the normally they have the big uh, the waterfalls. And so this is uh, another year's the pictures. And so this time, the no waters completely. And so the, not only the African case, the, also the, the, the park, the management, the, the people say this is the first time completely dry up the fall. And so even in the 1997 to 8, the similar the El Ninos, but the still enough amount of the water supplied because of the huge stock of the waters in, in the crowded forest areas. But now so the getting the dry more every years, maybe so the water is coming to short or drying up the ground. And so next one. So this is uh, something uh, whole more bigger the scale, the, the water and the carbon the relationship or circulation. And uh, in the bottom, you, you see the, already we are discussing the lowland peat and the huge amount of water stock and carbon stock. And so then, so water is uh, evaporated or transpirated and make a cloud and circulate it inside or sometimes they bring the water to the mountain, the side. And so the center is, uh, we call the heart of Borneo. Still remain the forestry, but uh, just the year by year, the deforested. And if the, the disappears the forestry, maybe the water stock is decreasing. Also, which means the, the if have the, the rain in, in, in the rainy season, and so water may be down off. And dry season, no stock, and dry up the, the rivers. And so this kind of the big, the, the, the circulated ecosystem, now we are very worried about destroyed by something, the, the human development of the pit, lowland pit, also highland pit. And so if the, the pit run the de degraded by, for example, the drain, and so this the increasing the vulnerabilities. And uh, this is the case of the, what to say, the, if the, we want to manage the, the pitran in, in, in dry, the pitran, the, the systems, so which is uh, vulnerability is increasing and uh, uh, resilience is decre uh, decreasing. But if we change the GIST system and re-wetting to keep high water levels, and so vulnerability is uh, decreasing and uh, resilience is increasing. So maybe this is uh, what to say, <laughs> the very drastically. We cannot uh, select it the, the between of this. So we decide which is better the management, the, this kind of the total ecosystem. Next one. So maybe, so this is the general the pictures of what is a function of the, the peatland. So key is the water. And so if the, the, the peatland forestry deforest, and so something impact climate change, the El Nino or so, and Lulucif, and drain, so that is a directly to affect to the water statues. And so if change the water statues, and maybe which means the reducing the water condition or amount of the waters, so which affect the carbon emission by fires, and also the carbon emission, 
the microorganism degradation, and also the carbon loss through the waters. And so we also found uh, this is the also affect to the, the carbon assimilation. The, this is a photosynthesis. And so the, this also decreasing by reduce of water tables. Next one. So the, normally we are thinking the productivity of the, the plant in Petran will be the small. But uh, from our actually the study uh, in the Kalimantan, and so the red one is uh, mixed de 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 corpus forestry, and the green one is uh, the peatland, and the gray one is uh, Kerangas, the very shallow peat, the, the sandy soils. And so the above, man, above ground biomass is very high in the mineral soils. Maybe this is uh, the, normally the, you agree. But productivity, the how much the produce the biomass per year per hectare. So if compa the, we, we we studied the, these values, and so the the mineral soil MDF mixed deforestry uh, the corpus forestry is low, and uh, if compared to this, so the wood product rate is very high almost uh, two or three times higher than the mineral soils in, in the peatland. And so the productivity is very high if it keeps uh, the high water tables, the, which is growing the natural the vegetations, which is very adapted to high water tables. And that the trees or ecosystem give two or three times higher the, the productivity. And so next one. So the another is a sago. So the sago is a, this is an ideal case in the Melanti. And so the very high the starch production, that is around 30 ton the starch per hectare per year. And the third one is a sago, the produce around 100 ton the biomass, the, that is the dry matter per hectare per year. This is something, the record of the, the biomass production the, in, in the global scales. And next one. So the, in, in the past, the, we are only thinking the, in the small case, the farmers or small, the, the, the private company that produce the, the starch the, from the sago in, in wetland. And so, yes, this is uh, also very important. And so this start to contribute to food and feed. And so, but you see the sago, the palm, gives a very high biomass also. And so this was a throw away and nothing, or sometimes uh, polluted to environment. And so, but uh, if use the biomass to other fuels, so which give the high values of the, the what they say, I say the, the securities, and also something biomaterials. And you see the sago more adapted to cross to the coastal areas, and so coastal or mangrove areas, also the, in this ecosystem, the nippers and the coconuts, and something the mixed forestry, the timbers, they will also produce a huge amount of biomass. And so we designed the, together with the, what is uh, the benefit to uh, incentive to conserve or destroy of this the, the wet the peatland. And so the economic values, potential economic value, very huge, but nothing touch about this kind of the, the materials the for, uh, until now. So now we think the including the, this kind of the values for peat restoration, the concept. Next one. So this is uh, the conclusion. So the, the left side, maybe you see the harvested the sun, I, I call. So what is the harvested sun? The already the fix the carbon by, by through the, the plants or then the stock as a, the fossil fuels. 
why is the oil and uh, coals and something gas? And so, but you know the, the COP21 the agreement, we must reduce drastically to use this kind of the, the fossil fuels. And so, another point, the, in all time, the stock, the carbon in wetland and uh, something coastal ecosystems. And so this is a, our, our topics to how to conserve the, these areas, so we, which we call, we call as uh, mitigations. So that is uh, the almost equal to the conservation and uh, the, that contribute to, to mitigate the uh, climate change. And so, but this, the, the international agreement, the COP21, and SDGs, another criteria to, to conserve the ecosystem, SDGs is sustainable development goals, and we have the 16 goals, and more detailed the goal is the huge, um, but uh, mostly related to something environment or ecological the system. How to estimate SDGs? This is another topic in futures. But anyway, so the introducing this kind of the, the criteria. Now, so the, already the, we discussing red plus, and so we can the, use this mechanism for the credit, carbon credit. And so the, the now, so you know, the Indonesia is uh, leading countries for the, talking about this kind of the red plus, but. So the Indonesian government to, to, to register uh, around 40 the red project, but among the 40s, only two now the come to the, the biodiversity reserve concession, which is called as a red project. And so one is uh, Dimba, Dimbaraya, and the uh, second one is PT Limba Makumura Utamas. And uh, very large the areas, the covering. But uh, you see the, the red program, the not officially the started in Indonesia. And they cover something, the CSR, something another. And so the, still the many problem of the debt. And uh, also the carbon credit, the value is very low the, in international market. And so this the credit mechanism is not so the good incentive to, to promote uh, the peat restorations. Um, but uh, this is uh, still very important. Um, but uh, we, I recommend to more focusing the harvesting sun. Now the we, what we do to harvest the sun. So maybe so which is related to uh, renewal energy, the wind, water, solar powers, so on. And another one is the biomass. And so I say, the, especially the peatland, give very high biomass, even compared to the mineral soils. And so then this is a something adaptation program to climate change. And so we the, the growing something, this is some examples, the sago, nipper, coconuts, and something trees. And we get the feed, feed, food, feed, and energy, and also something materials. And so now you see the CSR, only the Essex, but now so the after SDGs, the agreement, so the investors, especially bank, is now moving to ESG the M, uh, and SRI, environment social governance, and so socially responsible investment, this is a SRI. So what is this? Is not only the criteria. Okay, so the bank or international network of the bank to apply this, the criteria and estimate some company, for example, destroying the, the Petron. And so the, they, they calculated, for example, the SDGs, the marks, and if give very low the values, no invest, and maybe the company is <laughs> corrupt. So this is a very the strong, the powerful the tools, and we should do more the focusing on the mechanism of CGs, not only the, the carbon credit. 
And so the binding together the investment, and not only the credit, maybe so ask to the investment to the biomass. Then so the, what to say, the, the, what to say, the economic, the incentives, the increasing for local people and for the Indonesian government. And so next one, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Ozaki. Now the last speaker is Sirena Liu uh, from the Global Environmental Center. Uh, Global, Global Environment Center. She is a senior staff where she uh, is working on peatland-related issues, peatland management, supporting institutional development and uh, capacity and frameworks. Uh, also in co in collaboration with ASEAN, and so she will talk to us about community-based uh, peatland restoration. Uh, experience from 10 years. Please. Good afternoon, everyone. So, after a long discussion by our expert scientist colleague here, so now it's a community based practice. So, we actually how to transform the information from these technical findings and recommendations to government to really practice on the ground together with the community. So, when we talk about community engagement, we're actually looking at partnership. So it's one of the sustainable development goals uh, to have these partnerships for the goals. It's actually to share knowledge, share expertise, technology, and most important thing, to share the finance. To support the achievement of the sustainable development goals in all countries, in particular developing countries. So we actually engage the private sector, civil society partners, to build experience and resource strategies of the partnerships. So multi-stakeholders partnership with multi-funded projects and programs. We have the ASEAN in the middle because that's the ownership of the programs. Then we have um, international development agencies which provide financial support, technical support. We also have this NGOs partners. Um, local community partners as well. And not the least, the CSR partners. So we have Asamdabi, we have Bo, we have uh, Gamuda and other partners and funders. So these are the documented communities' best management practices in ASEAN region for the past 10 years. So we transform technology to practice which to engage also the community. So we get the community to participate. So we give them training workshops to strengthen their capacity. One of the most important thing is the fire happening on pitlands. So um, the technical partner, they come up with the forecast um, on the fire risk and how we disseminate this information to the community. So we develop the smartphone application. So we get the land manager to subscribe to the web, to the application as well. And then we disseminate automatically to the subscriber. Then engage them to participate, uh, to prepare their village map with utilization of GPS. So we have the technology in GPS, but usually GPS only used by the expert or uh, maybe our NGO colleague, but we really need to engage the local scientists because they're living there, they know their place, and it's their livelihood. Then for that uh, this dissemination of information, also community have their own system, their community radio system. So if they don't have internet coverage, but at least they have their community radio the lesson learned and experience sharing through environmental education, training and workshops to improve their skills. We also have this peer learning program to bring communities from one location to another location to learn from each other. So farming practices, sojan farming, uh, which is agroforestry practices to integrate planting of cash crop and medium term tree species. This can be uh, cash crop together with the rubber, gelotong. Um, 
floating garden, this is the concept with, uh, was developed in Philippines because they usually have their flood uh, every year. So they have this uh, flood garden concept. For the rehabilitation practices, water management and fire prevention, bank a living tree system actually developed by uh, Park Suido uh, from central Kalimantan. Then have a seedling buyback uh, program, uh, the seedling nursery developed by local communities and seedling um, to be south to the government agency or NGO to do the replanting at the degraded peatlands. Then canal blocking, community fire prevention and control. So this is a local community engaged to support patrolling and also to train them with the prevention measures and fire suppression and, and control. This is really happening in, in Indonesia because in Indonesia they have a Masyarakat Petuli Abi, the MPR program. For alternative livelihood development, green contract, very famous in Vietnam. This is actually to engage the community living within the buffer zone to take care of the buffer zone to protect uh, the, the national park. Then development of uh, environmental friendly energy, so integrate approach where cattle implantation fed with threaded palm leaves then the cow manual turned into biogas, which support the household usage in kitchen or the lights in the house. Ecotourism, so create awareness while providing income opportunity for local communities with limited damage to the ecosystem. Then a research and development, so research for compost or burnt organic waste to create ash for fertilizer in the cropping and other innovative to encourage us to use of uh, peatlands so that they don't do the burning on the peatland itself. So key factor for successful community engagement in peatland rehabilitation. So the first engage them from early stage. So they involve in the planning until they practice and do the maintenance. So also to support community organization development, generate clear benefit to community. So it must be clear, it's not unclear. So maybe they have some a blind promise, something like that, yeah. But this one is really have to, a, when you say something, you promise them to do it, you really have to fulfill that. Then uh, awareness enhancement and capacity building, seedling development, planting, maintenance, and fire prevention. So we have related hydrology and encourage power of nature to support natural regeneration. So uh, Wilmington National Park in Vietnam, this is a very successful story where Maluluka Forest on Pitland recognized as ASEAN Heritage Park in 2013, then designated as Ramsar site in 2016. So it's actually the commitment from the rocker authorities and technical support from scientists and research institute as well as the local community at buffer zone where improve livelihood reducing dependency on, on the forest. So this is a multi-stakeholder effort, multi-level uh, effort. So on this um, best, uh, best management practices, it actually come under this ASEAN Pitland Management Strategy 26 to 2020, uh, also under the umbrella of ASEAN Agreement on Transparent Haze Pollution, uh, which was signed in 2002. Then after that, there's an ASEAN Program on Sustainable Management of Pitland Ecosystem 2014 to 2020, which was endorsed by the ASEAN Environment Ministers in 2013. So under the ASEAN, Pitland sustain, uh, ASEAN program of uh, sustainable management of peatland ecosystem, there were six key targets uh, were endorsed. The first one, the peatland inventory. Second, zero burning and control burning uh, with exceptional cases. The third, replication. Fourth, Sustainable management, sustainable livelihood, sustainable economic use. Fifth, uh, uh, re reduction of greenhouse gases uh, emission. And the sixth, implementation of ASEAN Pitland Management Strategy and National Action Plan on peatlands. So this is very 
um, significant milestone for ASEAN in conserving the peatland ecosystem in the region. So from ASEAN agreement on trans pollution signed in 2002, then ASEAN Peatland Management Initiative in 2003, then ASEAN, manage, uh, ASEAN Peatland Management Strategy in 2006, then ASEAN uh, National Action Plan on Peatlands. So objective of future projects and program must be in line with the priorities of the ASEAN Social Cultural Community Blueprint. The intensifying implementation of the strategies national action plans, and also the ASEAN program. Support implementation of the ASEAN haze-free roadmap. This is new, the haze-free roadmap, and those uh, year ago. Um, then uh, upcoming projects, uh, there are four uh, global environment facility funded projects in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Mekong, and one uh, EU funded ASEAN cooperation in biodiversity and climate change program uh, with the title sustainable use of peatland and haze mitigation in ASEAN. Uh, then the Japan ASEAN integration fund. Then we have international fund for agricultural development uh, on measurable action for haze free Southeast Asia. All these projects are to achieve sustainable management of peatland through collective actions and enhance cooperation to support and sustain local livelihoods, reduce fire risk and associated haze, and contribute to global environmental management for a clean and green ASEAN. And there's a saying, cherish the earth starts from each individual's footsteps. So these are all our responsibility to take care of our earth, the mother earth, the pillar ecosystem. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Serena. Uh, okay, how, we, how do we bring all this together? Uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to say, uh, we're going to go five minutes over time. It's not enough to really get a discussion going, but at least I would like to allow some, a few questions. Uh, recently, I, I read something about the CK concept. It's another letter we add to the soup. Um, it seems to be a concept that, that comes f f from the industry and seems to play a role in some, some parts of the industry to organize their thinking. It's about C, concepts, and K, K, knowledge, and how we bring the two together. And I think in this session, maybe that's, that's how we can frame what, what, we, what we have seen in, in this session, how, how knowledge is needed, which we saw in the first presentations, new knowledge about peats, peat, uh, peatlands, the extent, the, the, the carbon stored there. Uh, but also, the knowledge doesn't tell you much if you don't have a concept how you deal with it. And I think the second part of the, of the, of the presentations gave us a little bit more insight into conceptual thinking, thinking out of the box, bringing communities in, working with communities, uh, learning from them too, and also thinking in, in, broader, uh, in broader ways than just uh, single crop systems, uh, but trying to develop a more integrated approach to management. And, and I also think we always t have a tendency to, to, to go into one direction, let's say red is going to solve everything, or this crop is going to solve everything, and I think we need to think of those systems in, in, in broader terms, in more integrated terms, and, and also in more diverse terms. And uh, I guess this is maybe the, the take home message today that if, if, we, if, we have, if we have the concepts alone without data, we don't get far. But we, we need data, we need the better ma uh, data for the better management of peatlands, we need also to better understand where peatlands are and, and how deep they are and how much carbon is there. But we also need to, to think about how we handle all this and, and I think that's, uh, that, that came out of the second part. Um, I'd like to open the floor for, for a few questions and then I, I give a very quick final round for uh, one sentence comments to the panel and uh, so stay with us for another five minutes. Who has questions? Please come forward. Or comments? Nobody? Everything is crystal clear? You know what to do now? 
when you go out here, you, how are you going to save peatlands from now on? Okay, um, then maybe let's go for, uh, to the panel again and, and maybe start from, from Professor Ozaki and then go this way. In just one sentence, what is your priority for the next steps? What would be the next thing that needs to be done? Uh, I think we need a microphone. One sentence. They're eager to get coffee. Take the. So the next step, the, the very clear is I, I showed the two mechanisms for incentive. One is a credit mechanism. But to establish the credit, so the huge the task work. Uh, so we want to to reduce this kind of task work using something a model, the, the, what to say, we de develop the satellite data and actually the monitoring and the binding, and so more easy to estimate the water tables and the CO2 emissions, something like that. So simplify that this, maybe so the more easy to apply to RDD or some another, the credit mechanism. And another the point, so we are still missing the, the something technology, how to use the biomass. So the lot of the, the, the project already the gone to Europe and Japan and but so on, but not adequate technology the in here, the small community base or several the 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 level the is required, not yet so developing. And so the Additional, the comment is uh, should be to to develop more uh, the water the management systems. So canal blocking is one idea, but uh, already the drained the, and the dried areas. If make a canals, no waters coming up, and so the irrigation is important. And uh, the okay. do do some. The mention about the, in the case of the Vietnam, the Umintong National Park. So this the totally bound the, the peat run in 1997 to 8 by big El Ninos. Then so the government decide to protect and make a big, the, the, they shut down the canals and make, a, what they say, the pumping up systems. Now so the, okay, the wet run keep. Don't, uh, yes. don't elaborate. Uh, so credits, better biomass management and Water management. Yep. Okay. Yes. Lira, please. Hi. So, thinking about the Congo Basin region, of course it's good to have better information and for any kind of land use or spatial planning, you need to know where the peat is. I don't think it's quite so important, although it's interesting and valuable, to know exactly how deep it is because once that peatland starts to degrade, you know, whether it's two meters or five meters, you'll still be getting significant annual emissions. So I think from a research you know, quantification perspective, pinning down the area has to be the first priority. But I also don't think you need to wait for that better information to be starting to, to work on the policy and to be identifying what the how the development needs of that area can be met in a way that still protects that valuable ecosystem and all of its services, not just the carbon stocks. Okay, so a two-pronged approach, getting better data while already working on the policies, I think, makes a lot of sense. Lira? Um, I would say welcome on board on the Pitland families and just do our best uh, use of our capacity and also to teach our friends or whoever uh, to really conserve and protect the um, pillar ecosystem in the world. Thank you. Yeah. Did I say Lira? Uh, sorry, <laughs> Serena. <laughs> okay, welcome to the club. <laughs> Babudi. So, from my part, uh, to make a better planning, we have to understand what is to be planned in there. And it's still too expensive for us using the luxurious technology as slider to do pitland management. So we need to find another way that we can gather or we can have good enough data without having to pay for that data so much. So a technology for that. Second part is those luxurious data is idle if we don't use it properly. 
So please uh, access those data and use it for research, for other purpose, even for measuring the carbon uh, from this uh, excellent data that we have. So it's open. So let's use that for the betterment of the uh, pit line management. I see everybody already on their cell phones accessing the data. <laughs> okay, Daniel? I, I like that C and K concept. I think having had the map, uh, it's yours, it's not ours, it's, it's open for public. Uh, conceptually speaking, um, it is usable to enter into this interaction with the NDC processes. So that's, that's the next very uh, destination we are heading to, mm. uh, how to locate this uh, precious uh, asset in terms of high carbon ecosystem, use the map and refine that, and we need knowledge. And this, with this knowledge, we, we can refine what, what we already have there, so it will be really applicable, uh, so it will you know, be very convincing to government, to local community, and also practitioner. So yeah, with the CNK thing, we, we can move forward with the map. And if you make next step and then turn right, you will see the lab, landscape lab and visit our, our map there. Thank you. Thank you. OK, CNK, use knowledge smartly in better concepts, develop better concepts to use knowledge and uh, work one step further in, in bringing all this into country uh, country uh, climate action embedded in or in incorporated in the NDCs. I think that's also a very important thing we need to work on. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Give, let's give a, a round of hands to the panel.